I think we're ready to begin. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to City Lights Live, the official online reading series of City Lights booksellers and publishers. I'm your host, Peter Maravellis. And tonight, in commemoration of Band Book Week, City Lights and Pen America present an evening of spirited discussion that brings together activists, authors, and librarians exploring the alarming rise in book bans across the country. We find ourselves once again at a pivotal moment. Books that address issues pertaining to race, gender, and sexuality are being brazenly attacked. The conversation these books generate is intricately tied to whether, as a nation, we are able to sustain democratic principles. The repression of books holds dire consequences for an equitable and just society. It becomes ever important for us to understand the scope of the threat and to mobilize to meet its challenge. Tonight's event is titled From Howl to Now, Book Bans in the U.S. And this evening's participants have all felt the impact of censorship. They will offer their insights, observations, and methods to counter the suppression of books. Our program tonight is intended as a call to action. I hope that each and every one of you thinks about the way in which you may be able to help in this. As many of you know, City Lights has a special relationship to the history of free expression in the United States. The Howell trial of the late 50s was a pivotal moment in the history of the free speech movement. The publication of the book Howell by Allen Ginsberg and the subsequent persecution in court case, and then City Lights prevailing in the court of law generated opportunities for publishers, such as Grove Press via Barney Rossett and New Directions via James Laughlin, to begin publishing books that had previously been censored and repressed. So it is significant to our conversation tonight that City Lights founder, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, risked going to jail for an extended period of time, losing all of his assets, and the store being forced to close out of business in defense of Howell. If it wasn't for the good graces of City Lights attorneys at the ACLU, the outcome may have been very, very different for us. In fact, the Howell trial wasn't the only court case that City Lights had to defend against. Uh, this is kind of a lesser known part of our history. There were two additional trials that extended as far as into the 70s. These involved the publication of The Pillow Book by Lenore Kendell, and actually of all things, a comic book. So City Lights has been at the epicenter of the battle for free expression since our inception. Actually, we published a book about the Howell trial. If any of you would like to learn more, I'm going to post a link a little bit later in the chat function. So please do check that out. Um, as is customary before each event, I would like to acknowledge that we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral homelands of the Ramatisha Loni peoples, also known as the San Francisco Bay Area. We'd like to pay our respects to those who have come before us as stewards of the land. So with us tonight is Ipek Burnett, a moderator for the program. She's going to be joined by Nick Stone, Becky Calzada, Leela Hensler, and Summer Lopez. Ipek Burnett is the author of the book, A Jungian Inquiry into the American Psyche, and is editor of the upcoming volume, Revisioning the American Psyche, A Jungian Archetypal Mythological Reflection. She is a contributing writer at Counterpunch and a Turkish novelist. She serves as the co-chair of Human Rights Watch Executive Committee in San Francisco. Joining her will be Becky Calzada, the District Library Coordinator in Leander, Texas. She is a co-founding member of Freedom Fighters and the recipient of numerous awards for her work, including the American Library Association's Robert B. Downs Intellectual Freedom Award, amongst others. She has served on numerous committees of advocacy organizations fighting to protect our freedom to read. Becky Calzada was honored by People Magazine in their 2023 Women Changing the World portfolio. Also joining us will be Leela Hensler, who is a teen advocate for human rights and academic freedom. As a student organizer for PEN America, she has helped plan and lead the Northern California Summit on Book Bans and the Freedom to Learn in partnership with San Francisco Public Library. As a student fellow for Rhizome, she advocated for the inclusion of student efforts against educational gag orders in the organization's 2023-24 National Action Plan. She's also worked with organizations such as United for Iran to expand solidarity efforts between teenage protesters in Iran and the United States. So really an honor to have her with us here tonight. Also joining us is Summer Lopez, PEN America's Chief Program Officer of Free Expression. She has been with the organization since 2017 and oversees PEN America's advocacy, research, and programming in defense of free expression in the U.S. and globally. Summer Lopez has worked uh, to advance democracy and human rights in the nonprofit and government sectors. 
including for eight years with the U.S. Agency for International Development and three years with the AJA Project. And last but not least, also joining us will be Nick Stone, the New York Times bestselling author of Dear Martin, Clean Getaway, and How to Be a Young Anti-Racist, amongst many other titles. Her most recent novel, Chaos Theory, was published in February of 2023. Her novels have been translated into six languages, and her writing has appeared in The Washington Post, Auburn uh, Avenue, and The Writer Magazine, amongst others. A word about our co-sponsor, PEN America stands at the intersection of literature and human rights to protect free expression in the United States and worldwide. Their mission is to unite writers and their allies to celebrate creative expression and defend the liberties that make it possible. Founded in 1922, PEN America is the largest of more than 100 centers worldwide that make up the PEN International Network. PEN America works to ensure that people everywhere have the freedom to create, literature, and to convey information and ideas. I will now turn it over to Ipik Burnett. Welcome, everyone, to City Lights. Such a pleasure and an honor to have you with us. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for that wonderful introduction and a very warm welcome to everyone who is uh, joining us today for this very important discussion. I am thrilled, beyond thrilled, to have this remarkable panel this evening representing multiple unique points of view on the book bands. So Summer, Nick, Leela, Becky, thank you all for joining us. Before we dive in, I do want to take a moment to share a few words on the Band Books Week. Band Books Week was originally launched in 1982 in response to a surge uh, in uh, book bands in schools, libraries, and bookstores. And here we are, 41 years later, facing an unprecedented crisis. According to PEN America's most recent report, which was published just last week, there has been a 33% increase in book bans just this year compared to last year. And last year's numbers were staggering enough. So having said all this, I just want to remember and remind everyone that Band Books Week is not only about censorship. It's not only about repression. It is also about, and perhaps more importantly, it's about the great and deeply meaningful efforts of many, many librarians teachers, students, authors, community members who defend again and again, defend the freedom to read. So let's make space for that this evening as well and celebrate their dedication, their diligence, their resilience, and their courage. And now I'm going to invite Summer Lopez from PEN America to lay the groundwork for our conversation this evening. And Summer, Please tell us about all the challenges we're facing and while doing so, if possible, also talk about those moments of breakthrough, moments of inspiration and hope and success. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Epic, and to Peter and City Lights for co-hosting with us for this wonderful event. Um, and thank you to Nick and Becky and Lila for being a part of this. We are so lucky to get to hear from you all tonight. And we at PEN America are so honored to have you all as partners in the fight against book bans. I'm really delighted to be here this evening to mark Banned Books Week, and this year we're doing so with a greater sense of urgency to reverse this growing crisis that is erasing ideas and topics in classrooms and libraries and silencing authors, especially underrepresented writers who are in the crosshairs of this censorship campaign. And I always have to say that personally, it's really a special thrill to be part of an event with City Lights because I grew up in Southern California. We'd often used to make trips up to San Francisco. I have really vivid memories of being a child and falling in love with the magic of a bookstore like City Lights that offered new stories and new ideas. And that's the magic that books offer to children and to all of us. And it's the magic that's at stake today. And as Peter's introduction made clear, attacks on books are nothing new in this country and book bans have never gone away completely. PEN America has been fighting back against them for decades, speaking out to ensure that books like The Bluest Eye, A Handmaid's Tale, Slaughterhouse-Five, and To Kill a Mockingbird remain on classrooms and on library shelves. But typically, we deal with maybe a couple of cases of book bans a year across the country. In the past two years, that has completely changed. At no point in recent memory, probably since the start of Banned Books Week in the early 80s, have we seen anything like what's happening right now. 
were watching books disappearing from library shelves, being challenged in droves, being decreed off limits by school boards and legislators. And again, overwhelmingly, it's the books, writers, and stories that have long fought for a place on the shelf that are being targeted. Books by and about people of color, LGBTQ people, and women. Books about race, racism, gender, sexuality, and US history. Since July 2021, PEN America has recorded nearly 6,000 instances of books being banned across the US. And over the past year, these trends have continued to worsen. As Ipik mentioned in our latest report, which came out in September, we documented 3,362 book bans during the 2022 to 2023 school year, which is a 33% spike over the previous school year. The largest number of book bans, over 40% of what we documented, occurred in Florida, followed by Texas, Missouri, Utah, and Pennsylvania. And this year, in addition to the targets of targeting of books on races and racism and, and featuring characters of color and LGBTQ plus characters, we're also seeing books on the list that deal with issues of physical abuse, health and well-being, and themes of grief and death. And we're seeing hyperbolic and misleading rhetoric about porn in schools and sexually explicit, harmful, and age-inappropriate materials leading to the removal of books covering a range of topics and themes for young audiences. And notably, most instances of the book bans we're seeing are affecting young adult books, middle grade books, chapter books, even picture books, books that are specifically written and selected for younger audiences, and often specifically to help them wrestle with these challenge challenging issues and experiences. And last year, we talked a bit about the impact of organized groups campaigning to restrict the freedom to read. This year, we're seeing the impact of those groups, but combined with new and punitive legislation that has put schools and educators on alert and created really difficult dilemmas for school districts, forcing them to either restrict access to books or risk potential penalties for educators and librarians. We've seen a trio of laws enacted in Florida, for example, that bar instruction on sexual orientation or gender identity, prohibit educators from discussing advantages or disadvantages based on race, and mandate that schools must catalog classroom and library books in great detail. And we've seen the impact of vaguely worded legislation, for example, a law in Utah that prohibits certain sensitive instructional materials in schools. Such legislation is having a chilling effect on educators and school districts who are wary of putting the wrong book in a child's hands, especially those that are already facing pressure from local advocacy groups. And I wanna be clear always that none of this is to say parents can't or shouldn't be involved in or have a say in their child's education. It's why we have PTAs and parent-teacher conferences and school board meetings. But when a single parent makes a decision for everyone else's children, they've made a decision for all those other parents and they violated those children's right to access the full range of stories and content that professional educators had assessed and deemed appropriate for them. So I just wanna emphasize two last things about what we're seeing in this moment before we turn to our panel. One is that these books, these book bans are not happening in isolation. So over the past two years, we have also documented a broader movement to exert ideological control over public education across the US. We've called this campaign the Ed Scare in reference to the, the Red Scare of years past. And it's reaching into public libraries, higher education institutions, and public schools using state legislation, intimidation tactics to suppress teaching and learning about certain stories, identities, and aspects of history. And this has included explicit legislative prohibitions to restrict teaching about certain topics in both K through 12 and higher education contexts which we've called educational gag orders, as well as an increasing number of legislative mandates that require intrusive forms of inspection or monitoring of teachers and librarians, which we've called educational intimidation bills. And all of these are having a dramatically restrictive effect on the freedom to read, learn, and think for students. And finally, I wanna say that we should not see this simply as a concern for parents and teachers, but for all of us who are invested in the next generation of Americans, of citizens, because the freedom to read is essential to our democracy. And the movement to ban books is inherently undemocratic, inflicting restrictions on all students and families based on the preferences of a few and banning books based on the ideas that they contain. And access to a diversity of books, ideas, stories, and perspectives is the basis of education in a democracy. Ideas are not to be feared in a democracy, engaged with, considered, debated, challenged when necessary, sometimes fought back against, but not feared and not banned. 
And at PEN America, we also defend the freedom to write globally. We advocate on behalf of writers who are harassed and put in prison and harmed around the world because their words are deemed a threat to those in power. So we know that book banning is also an authoritarian tactic. It's a tool of tyrants that we associate with Nazi Germany, apartheid South Africa, and Putin's Russia. And we know that authoritarians go after books and writers because words and stories are powerful. They allow people to imagine a better and different world. But there is a bright side to this story, and that's part of why I'm particularly excited to hear from our panel tonight, because this movement is not going unchallenged. And we know that it reflects only a small minority. Surveys show that 80% of Americans oppose the banning of books. So that is across political lines, across any number of demographic, demographic factors. And across the country, the campaign to ban books is being countered by ordinary citizens, by authors like Nick, whose books have been targeted, and by leaders like Leela and Becky, who have spoken out and fought back to insist that schools remain places where students have access to a diversity of viewpoints. And we certainly hope you'll join us in this fight too. Um, I'll drop some links in the chat uh, with uh, connect that will bring you to our report um, and to some action, uh, action opportunities for you for Banned Books Week. Um, and I just wanna say thank you again so much to all of you for being here and I will turn it over to Ipik and our wonderful panel. Thank you, Summer. Thank you so much. That was very helpful. And as you beautifully articulated, and Peter has also alluded to in his introduction, it really comes down to democracy. This is fundamentally about democracy. Who gets heard and who gets silenced? Whose voices, whose perspectives, whose stories are welcomed, included, and whose are rejected and omitted? And when we take their books you know, out of the classrooms, out of the curriculum, uh, down from the bookshelves. When we box them up, when we ban them, shame them, then we are missing. Missing is not even a strong enough word, of course. We are knowingly destroying opportunities for some very, very important, necessary conversations about American history, society, social justice. And on that note, I do wanna to turn to Nick Stone. Nick, it's such an honor to have you with us here this evening. I know you're on tour for How to Be a Young Anti-Racist, which you co-authored with uh, Ibram X. Kendi. So thank you for taking the time and joining our conversation. And let's just start right there with that book. How is How to Be a Young Anti-Racist? relevance to our conversation here in this moment about censorship, book bans, democracy? Um, you know, that's a really good question. Uh, I'm, my answer is going to be a bit broad. I think how to be a young anti-racist is just relevant to life, um, especially life in really life anywhere. I think that as human beings, we have a tendency, honestly, a biological one. If you look through evolutionary history, we have these these old biological leanings towards separating ourselves off based on shared characteristics with other people. And I'm really into like anthropology and I'm, obs I'm obsessed with um, the work of a man named Yuval Noah Harari. Um, Sapiens is one of his books. Um, there's a, there are a bunch of, he's written a bunch of books. And so I, I got really into those books while working on how to be a young anti-racist. And they really helped me to zoom out a bit. So in these conversations that, we, that we're having about censorship and books, et cetera, I think the most important thing, both for us as the people dealing with the censorship and the people who are being banned, and for the other people who are doing the banning and doing the censoring, I think we've kind of lost sight of the fact that we're all people and that it's important that we learn about one another in order to work together to continue into a future where everybody is is well taken care of right so when i think of of how to be a young anti-racist in this this conversation that we're having it's a book that really helps to unpack the history of some of the ideas that are really driving people to ban books. Um, there are a lot of ideas that, that people subscribe to kind of without really thinking, like there are a lot of things that get taken for granted in a country like the United States, which was built on very 
interesting <laughs> principles, I'll put it like that. Um, so having a resource where you can go in and you can look at the ways that racism intersects with other bigotries, you can look at the ways that people are conditioned to be unkind to one another. And you can look at the ways that like, you know, it's like, it, it's also just an opportunity to take a look at yourself, right? So in the midst of conversations like these, having resources like how to be a young anti-racist that break all of this stuff down, right? Like, I love hearing people use the word democracy. And I'm also fully aware of the fact that, you know, most eight to 18 year olds don't actually know what it is. They're not being taught what it means to live in a democracy. Like what is a representative democracy? So having those kinds of resources where we actually are teaching kids the meaning of these words that are being tossed around with them in mind is really important. Thank you, Nick. Um, beautifully put. I do wanna now uh, wanna turn to Dear Martin, which is currently banned in Florida, Texas, South Carolina. And it's a YA book, but in my opinion, it should be uh, read by everyone of all ages. Uh, for those of those people in the audience right now who have not gotten a chance to read it yet, can you give a little bit of an overview of the story and also share with us what, what moved you, inspired you to write this book? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm really good at this elevator pitch because I've been doing it for six years. Uh, <laughs> Dear Martin is a book about a 17-year-old African-American boy who, after a traumatic experience with racial profiling, decides to start a journal of letters to the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to see how Dr. King's teachings and ideas hold up here in the 21st century. And it's a book that I wrote as the mother of two Black boys. Like I have two sons. Um, when my older son was five months old, I heard about the shooting death of a young man named Jordan Davis in Jacksonville, Florida. He was at a gas station with some friends one night. They had the music turned up in the car and a man pulled into the parking lot next to them, was bothered by both the type of music they were listening to and the volume at which they were listening to said music. And within Three and a half minutes, he unleashed a hail of gunfire and uh, Jordan Davis was killed. And at that point with this new baby that I'd spent 40 weeks like allowing to suck the marrow out of my bones. And like, we all start out as biological parasites friends. And I had one inside my body eating away at all of my nutrients and growing and then you got to get the thing out and that's a whole experience all that said you want to hold on to it right so thinking about my son and this this being that i spent all of this time and energy kind of bringing into the world and noticing that this kid who lost his life like my son will eventually be tall he's a black boy you know the thinking about what my son might eventually face as a result of the body that he was born into is really what got me thinking about Dear Martin. And then, you know, a couple of years later, uh, 2014, um, young man named Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson, Missouri. And I was really bothered by the way I kept hearing um, public figures, political leaders, et cetera, using the words of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in opposition <laughs> to some of the protesting that was happening in the streets of Ferguson. And so I was just real mad, basically. Um, so the, the incident with Jordan Davis and, and the, the anger over Dr. King's words being used to oppose something that he literally did for a decent chunk of his career as a civil rights leader, uh, those two things taken together inspired me to write Dear Martin. And I'm actually working on the third book in the series right now, which is all about democracy and how this country was founded and how the government works. So onwards we go. I'm so excited to get my hands on that third one. Um, thank you so much for sharing that personal bit and your feelings that drove you to write this beautiful, powerful book. Did you, while you were writing it, did you anticipate any of these challenges, Ben's? No, not at all. I mean, I didn't even know like 
if anybody was going to read it at all, right? Like, it's it's one thing to be writing a book for the sake of learning things for myself, like me trying to learn about this world that I'm going to send my sons out into and also creating a resource for them to look to if they ever win, I should say, when they start facing um, treatment from people that is undeserved just because of the bodies they live in. So I'm all I cared about was creating something for my children. So I was very surprised at how many people took to it initially. And my first experience with banning was in 2019. Um, in Augusta, Georgia, Columbia County, Georgia, because, and I'm from Atlanta, right? So like Georgia, like it'd be your own people, Georgia, come on. Um, but Georgia was the first state to have a ban on Dear Martin. And I was pretty shocked to be completely honest. Um, but now I don't really get mad anymore. It's like, it, it unfortunately is not surprising. Um, I just write more books. Good for you and good for us. <laughs> um, what about, oh, what do you imagine Dr. King would say about your book being banned? You know, I think Dr. King, I don't really think we have to imagine it, right? Like he said a lot of things. These things that are happening now are not new. Um, to Kill a Mockingbird was published in 1960 and it was banned like that same year, right? Like people do not like books that, challenge the status quo like the people who are benefiting from the status quo don't like anything that challenges the status quo and you know he talked a lot about censorship he talked a lot about you know the maintaining the status quo and how you know as people who want that to change there are tactics that we can use to push back he talks a lot about you know, nonviolence, making sure that the ways that we push back didn't involve violence and even even in that I remember uh, the first time I heard the quote, Dr. King's quote that people use when there's rioting happening. And he talks about rioting being the language of the unheard. Like the, he's, the things that are lauded about Dr. King now frequently are decontextualized, which is part of the reason I wrote Dear Martin, right? Like it's important to me to make sure that the legacy of this man who at one point was the most hated man in America lives on um yeah so he said a lot i think all we really have to do is go through and look at what he was saying about the same stuff happening back then to know exactly what he would say now yeah and and speaking of status quo keeping it i came across an essay you wrote short but very very powerful essay about reluctant readers in which you interrogate that label that's put on some uh young people students and you say it is not them who are reluctant. It is us, the grown-ups. Can you can you say more about that? Unpack that a little here. Yeah, definitely. Listen, kids don't want to read boring books. Like I, my children are listening to a book series right now, and there's a, a quote from the the book they're on today. There was a quote that we I dropped them off at school this morning. Um, Young men are guilty when they forget what, no, old men are guilty when they forget what it was like to be young is basically, it's like the gist of the quote. And I think that frequently we become adults, we like suddenly got all these bills to pay and all this responsibility and like people expect you to like work so that you have money. Like <laughs> There are all of these terrible things that come with adulthood. And in the thick of all of that, I think we lose sight of what it was like to be a young person. I hated most of the things I had to read when I was in middle and high school. Like, y'all, I would like to take Lord of the Flies and like, just leave the boxes on that same deserted island. I, that's what I wanted to do. I should say, that's what I wanted to do when I was 16. Like I, when I had to read that book in school, I wanted that book to be lost on an island somewhere where nobody could find it because I couldn't connect to it. It didn't make sense to me. And I, I find that that's true of a lot of, of young people who are reading these same books that I was reading 20 years ago in high school. 
So it's not that the readers are reluctant. We're just reluctant to give them something they can actually connect to. And I think that has a lot to do with illusions of control is one of them. And then I think it also has to do with the fact that like, because we've been teaching the same things for so long, there's almost this comfort in kind of continuing that forward instead of doing the work to learn a new book, to teach a new book. Um, so I just call kids high, I call the kids who don't love reading yet high taste readers. They just have higher tastes than the stuff that we're giving them, right? Like they don't really want to read The Crucible or The Scarlet Letter because they don't feel like it relates to them and they have higher tastes than that. So let's, you know, give them something else. Like why give them caviar when they would prefer Takis? You know what I'm saying? Like. Let's meet the, the kids where they are. Like, um, thank you. This is why your books are such a gift for the young readers today and uh, many generations to come, I would say, but we'll see if they will choose <laughs> what they're reading. <laughs> but I very much look forward to reading this new book that you're working on, on democracy. That is very, very exciting. Um, and now I'm gonna turn to Becky. And as uh, Peter introduced to Becky, Becky is a librarian, educator, and an activist. She's the co-founder of Freedom Fighters, and she's joining us from Texas. I want to start by asking you, Becky, about your vocation. Why librarian? What made you want to become a librarian? How did your journey start? So my journey started as an educator, truly. Um, I am um, a first generation uh, US citizen. My parents, my mother was born in Bolivia. My dad was born in Mexico um, and eventually came here and became, you know, met and became naturalized citizens. And they only had an education up to eighth grade. Um, so education was important, it was prioritized and they may not have been able to do helped me in certain things, on, especially when I got to high school. Um, but what they knew is that um, reading could grow me as a, you know, grow me and intellectually. Um, and they knew that education was going to be, you know, important. So went to school, became a teacher because um, at the time I just didn't consider librarianship. I, I did, I was actively involved in my public library. I used to hide out in my school library because I was one of those kids that was just shy and kind of anxious. I, I just didn't have a group to run with. So I would just bring my lunch to the library and I would sit in the library and the librarian just let me be there. And, and, I, and I've always just had my head and nose in books, you know, but again, being a first generation um, high school graduate and going to college was like a big thing. My parents didn't even want me to leave South Texas. I was born in South Texas in, Mer in a small town Mercedes, which is like 15 minutes from the border. And, you know, being the oldest and a girl, um, you know, in a Mexican American family, like that's just, you know, that was a lot, you know, so I was lucky enough to get about 300 miles away. <laughs> um, but the only, you know, vocation there that I wanted to do was being a teacher because uh, the closest library school wasn't, you know, it, it was in Austin. Um, so fast forward after, you know, getting a divorce and all, I just decided to become a librarian. I actually, um, was nudged by a school librarian that I worked with in a school that I taught. Um, I just, again, that love of books. I, I think I was probably a, a librarian in my classroom. I was doing, I was reading, I was a, a first grade teacher. And so I, I was creating a classroom library in my classroom before it was even a thing. I you know, was bringing in newspapers and comic books and all kinds of things, going into the library and bringing library books down, buying library books, you know, buying books for my kids and reading. Everything had a story to launch. Um, and just, you know, I think, again, just thinking about wanting to um, go to take another step in my in my professional career, librarianship just seemed to be the right step. And so went to library school at UT and um, and didn't look back. And I think now when I think about I don't know that I really understood the path. And so one of the things that I really work hard to do is when I see a really strong teacher that has a passion for literacy, um, a, a leader, you know, and just a good instructional partner, I nudge them to consider librarianship because we need school librarians. And I don't think they 
understand the path. And in the state of Texas, um, our credentials, um, you have to be a certified teacher, but you also have to get a master's degree in uh, library science or another de another you know degree. It's just how you have to have a master's and so take a test. And so we're a very specialized um, group of professionals on the campus because we're teaching in the largest classroom in the library. We see all the kids and not only are we um, teaching kids, we're also, you know, partners with our teachers and teaching our teachers. And so um, it's, I've, it's just been a wonderful career move. And I've just, I've enjoyed every minute. That's wonderful. I'm so glad you follow that through. And how then can you also tell us your journey to becoming an activist in this space? Yeah, I, I get asked that question a lot, because I, I am surprised that I'm where I'm at. Just because again, I think about um, how shy I was. I was that kid in school that you have to rip me off of my mom's arms because I didn't want to stay. Um, in high school, though, I just became, you know, got a little more um, engaged with different clubs and organizations, and that continued in college. Um, I think along the way, you meet people that sort of nudge you and encourage you, and I think you also come across people that, you know, for me, leadership has also been a passion, and so. I would meet people and, and learn from these particular leaders of like what to do, what not to do. Um, but I also think ultimately that um, my librarianship led to a lot of advocacy work. You know, you hear often that people don't understand the work of librarians um, sometimes, and I believe in the importance of telling the library story. Um, and, but I also believe too, you can't start telling the story when there's a problem. You need to, you know, make, build, you know, partnerships with your um, students, with your teachers, with your parents and community, with your administrators and invite them in and be partners with them because, you know, we, we all work, we want to work together. We all want to work and we're here for kids. And so some of that is just, you know, telling the story about the work that we do, learning when to advocate for funding and what we could do with funding. And again, these small moves and then also joining um, a library uh, association like the Texas Library Association, you know, there's a, so much leadership capabilities and opportunities in there that if, you know, libraries will, libraries will take advantage, you know, start maybe with a committee and pretty soon you're leading the committee or maybe you take on a role like I did as a, as a chair elect for the school division. And I think all of those moves you know, brought me where I am today in that, you know, there were opportunities. Can you go speak to, with the education committee? Can you go talk to a legislator? You know, and it didn't happen overnight. It happened, you know, slowly. Um, but as far as the work that I'm even doing today, I think, you know, my partner and I, Carolyn, you know, we, when we thought about this idea, we were just in the midst of just being pounded by the things that librarians were at the time. We were, you know, pornographers and we were, you know, I mean, we were just getting hammered and, and nobody was talking about what books can do for readers. Nobody was talking about the credentials of librarians and we were very frustrated. And so, you know, a, a group of us, and it wasn't just her and I, where there were four of us that got together and what can we do to counter this message and sort of hash this idea to um, take over the, the Texas Ledge hashtag. And so we wrote these plans up and we shared with authors, we shared with the librarians and we told everybody it was a secret. And in on that one day, I mean, we had over 13,000, I mean, like just so many tweets and trending topic and we didn't imagine, I mean, I was working, I, I couldn't, I mean, I scheduled tweets in the morning and then I just didn't tweet during the day because I try, try to have like this work balance, like I'm not supposed to be working, right? Um, but that just showed us that people were looking and seeking something hopeful. It gave a lot of librarians hope. I think it also um, allowed authors the opportunity to um, share the work that they do and, and show them the impact that their books are having on readers because nobody was talking about that. They were only talking about how oh, this book had that and this book is bad for this. And it just was all negative. And so trying to counter that narrative with the actual work and the true um the truths of of the work that we do so thank you becky and thank you so much for telling us a little 
about the work of freedom fighters. And I love that you put so much emphasis on collaboration in there. It's librarians with librarians, with teachers, with students and parents. It is community effort. Thank you. And we, as summer summarized in the beginning, you know, right after Florida, Texas, right? Um, can you talk specifically about your states, the challenges, and as well as opportunities in your state? Well, right now, some of the challenges are around some of the, well, a specific piece of legislation that was passed, uh, uh, which was, you know, uh, Senate Bill 900, um, which is currently in litigation. Um, we, right now, it's the, the, the state has been allowed to, you know, continue um, initiating this plan, which it, it's, it's, it's a year long timeline in terms of the implementation piece. Those are probably the challenges. And I think it also comes with the challenges of um, school districts seeing this opportunity with this law and making changes or enforcing things that shouldn't be forced yet. Um, we have examples of like, you know, school district like Haiti, Texas, that is not allowing their librarians to make any purchases at all. Things that came in are, are stuck, so they're not purchasing anything. And so um, we also know that there are places um, where school um, librarians have to submit their lists um, and have to get them reviewed by administrators um, before they can be purchased. And so they're also changing policies, you know, based on a law that, you know, still is currently, you know, being litigated. And so there, those are definitely challenges. I think opportunities, though, are um, helping, you know, to, to trying to figure out where are the opportunities to help build understanding about timelines like this, you know, um, our state organization has been really great about posting information about um, HB 900 and, um, you know, what the timeline is, you know, the current litigation and that kind of thing. And I know for me in my play, in my, where I am in my, where I work, that has been really helpful um, because there's a lot of misinformation out there and, you know, we all need to kind of be on the same page. And I think it also builds understanding in the community because again, where we have, um, a minority of people that want to remove certain books, they are leveraging that law to get things removed now. And um, so having to be explicit about, uh, we're still following our policies, we're still reviewing books. If you have a concern, we're still gonna follow the reconsideration process, those kinds of things. Um, but unfortunately, that's not necessarily the case everywhere. Um, so that's probably you know a downside too. So. Um, so yeah, I think again, another, and one last opportunity is gonna be, you know, I think through the work that we've done, reminding prof librarian professionals is that, you know, if you keep hearing the same questions come up, those are opportunities for you as professionals to build transparency and to address versus um, letting people guess what the answers could be. I think it's so important um, to be systematic about communication. Um, as library professionals, but also with our administrators, and so that we're all on point in terms of, you know, this is these are the, the the procedures. These are these are this is the information. This is how we select books. Whatever those questions are, that we are all not guessing, but we are all saying, well, here's that we actually have something written up of how how we select books. We have um, here's some information if you'd like to visit with your librarian. I mean, we're just all on point like that. So I think that's. Um, an opportunity for, for people should they choose to, to take advantage of that. And and to follow up on that, this is not exactly, this isn't about Texas national, but I think it's still relevant. Washington Post found out that and reported that 986 complaints against specific books were issued by the same 11 people. And this is something Summer also alluded to. There is most Americans, including Republicans, they oppose book bans. They support librarians. They support teachers. But there is this small yet very vocal group, um, very well organized, very well funded. And um, they make a lot of noise. I found online these manuals, step-by-step, -step, guidelines, templates, 
how to ban a book, how to write a complaint. You just copy paste. Um, how to show up at a school board meeting and what to say. And though it's, a, as I said, a small group, they are quite threatening, intimidating because they do make a lot of noise. And we hear that some librarians, teachers, you know, they want to avoid the trouble, the controversy. They worry about their jobs, rightly so. They worry about their own safety even. I mean, they're already so burnt out. We, they face so much pandemic, school shootings, and now there's this. Um, so what are your thoughts on self-censorship this way? And how can we, as a community, as citizens, support librarians, teachers, not just through in this specific week, Band Books Week, but throughout the year? So self-censorship is is not a good thing. Um, unfortunately, though, it is part of the chilling effect of, you know, when you see what's happening around you, when you hear about these laws that are being implemented or enacted, or when you see um, other librarians um, and the things that they're going through, because they are telling their stories and the stories that some are sharing are, are awful, they're horrific. Um, so I can understand the fear. I think one of the things that is so important though is um, for us to think about what can we do when we're in this, when we're feeling, um, when we have that sense that, you know, I'm, I'm hesitant. I know for us as a group in, in my district, we talk about these things. It's so important to talk about. And I think also too, because librarians are singletons on their campus, like they have nobody I say it to be accountable for, yes, they do. But I mean, in terms of like, do they know, like, let me reach out to another colleague of the same level and let's talk about this. Let's have a professional conversation about where's the best placement for this. You know, we know as professionals um, that we should look at reviews. If we have questions, why not have a conversation and not let it be rooted in um, fear or any emotion. I, I believe that, you know, when you make decisions, it shouldn't be rooted in emotion. It should be rooted in your practice. And so what can groups, librarian groups do together to stay rooted in what's the practice that we're going to follow if we have questions about where the placement of a book is? Because I mean, it happens. I mean, I think we, that's, that's always been a normal part of, you know, when you purchase books, but because of the climate right now, we're just extra sensitive and we're being reactionary versus being thoughtful and professionals and, and having conversations about it. Now, regarding your question for uh, what can um, people that wanna get engaged, I think it is it is true that these uh, the vocal minority are very um, engaged there they've got all these books i mean i remember seeing somebody shared a facebook message i mean they were having a meeting about how to to pro how to submit a reconsideration i you know i mean it happens and i mean something i can do about it but it's what it is right i think the thing that um, people should remember is that um your silence is an action so you need to do something and so that could look like reaching out to your um, campus principals and saying you support access and if there's ever a need um, that you're here to support. Um, reaching out to your school board and writing a letter or going there to speak because you know again there's these are very connected and um, people and they they make plans to go. I've seen groups that come together and they they take turns and so they'll go to to speak against the the censorship group so that there's an, an additional voice advocating for intellectual freedom. Um, I say, check in, to, check in with your librarians. How are you doing? What can I do for you? Um, um, you know, just of words of appreciation. Um, we're, a lot of them are only hearing negative things and you know, who's giving the affirmation. Um, and then I also think too, another thing that people can do is have conversations and leverage your circle of influence. We all have a, a circle of influence. You know, I have my circle, you know, everybody has a different level, but if you spoke to five people about the current issues that are happening on the intellectual freedom front, and then challenge those five people to tell five more people and what to do and how to get engaged, we start to multiply and we can drown out that vocal minority. 
um, like you said earlier, you know, United Gets Book Bands has documentation. I know Penn does too, that shows um, that that most people are against censorship. So how can we share those statistics and build understanding? Because people are are spreading in misinformation. They are saying things like these high school books are in elementary classrooms or libraries, which they are not. I mean, I, we had somebody the other day come talk to a librarian about a book that they said was inappropriate. The library didn't even own this book. So that's the kind of things that we're dealing with. And um, I mean, we're, and we're gonna, we're gonna address each one, but just know that every time, you know, if, if 10 people were to call a school, a school and, and share their support, you know, call or email their support for intellectual freedom and access, I mean, that would, that would make a difference. Thank you for that thoughtful response. I mean, it's it's interesting. We think of libraries as this, you know, quiet zone, right? Hushed environment. But behind that quiet front, there's such a roar, such this power and life force fueling intellectual freedom, freedom to learn, freedom to read. So well, thank you for that. Yeah, you should I, know our, our school libraries are not quiet anymore. They're, no. they're busy. If they're quiet, they're probably empty or the, the lights are out. <laughs> busy space. Um, Thank you, Becky. I'm now going to turn to Leela. Leela is our student organizer, student activist, really representing for us this evening the next generation leaders. Um, Leela, it's such a pleasure to have you here with us. I want to start right away and ask you about parents' rights, your take on parents' rights, this vocal minority we've been talking about. They claim that it's their right to protect their children from certain content in the books, which, you know, we've been talking about it again and again. It's race, gender, sexuality, American history, mental health, even at this point. How does that make you feel as a young person? And what about students' rights? What about young people's rights? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, first of all, I want to say that um, when I was younger, uh, my parents absolutely were very focused on bringing reading into my life and um, also into my classrooms as a way to uh, help me and other students connect. Um, so some of my really defining childhood memories were uh, every year around Diwali and around Hanukkah, uh, my mom and my dad would come into my classrooms and they would read books on like what it was to be Indian and Hindu in the US or what it meant to be Jewish. And I think that for a long time, I didn't value the importance of other kids being exposed to those points of view in elementary school until I got to my much bigger middle school. And um, I was one of the only mixed race students in my grade. I was one of the only Jewish students in my grade. And the um, amount of ignorance that a lot of other students had uh, was really shocking to me. And um, I don't think I appreciated just how much of an impact my parents just, you know, reading children's books about our cultures to my classmates had on making an elementary school a safer and a happier experience for me and for the other like South Asian and Jewish kids in my class. So I am very much against like people trying to restrict what they want to expose their kids to, because I believe that when you make classrooms more open, when you give kids the chance to learn about people who are different than themselves, you are you know, giving them basic skills like empathy and a sense of responsibility to others in their community that are going to serve them really well in the long run. And when you deprive them of that opportunity, when you arbitrarily decide for yourself that it's not okay for your child to learn about this other group of people, uh, you're not restricting them from learning about them. You're ensuring that they only learn about your point of view of them, and you're depriving them of so many important skills that come from reading different books. And you're depriving them of the ability to think critically, you're depriving of them of the ability to form a cultural consciousness for themselves. Um, because I feel that from what I've seen, and from what I've uh, heard from reading these pen, reading Penn's reports and speaking to other student organizers in Penn is that when people are trying to remove their children from reading about a certain book in the classroom, 
they're trying to ensure that they only are exposed to one particular view of this information. Um, and at the same time, it's often these same people who try to like both sides, other debates, who try to both sides um, debates about the Holocaust, who try and both sides debates about slavery and are in favor of students in schools still doing both sides debates on those topics. Um, and I don't think you can have it both ways. I don't think you can say we should, you know, see, hear everyone out on both sides and then at the same time argue for books being taken out of schools so you can only share one side and only share your views with your child. Um, so. Leela for president, that's all I gotta say. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Thank you. I agree, Leela, your perspective is so essential to these conversations we're having. So thank you so much. Um, and can you give us some examples as an organizer? What are some of the activities that you have organized with your friends to raise awareness about these issues, book ban, censorship, but also education and intellectual freedom? Absolutely. So um, right now, I am so excited to be working with students across California uh, on a new campaign that we are also um, consulting with some Penn uh, youth directors about, which is called the Golden State Readers Campaign. Um, I'm going to put a link to our Instagram in the chat, but it's bringing together uh, students from across California, from SoCal to Northern California in joining together to help ensure that A, we can help fight back against book bans in other states, and B, that we are able to arrange for students who currently do not have access to books due to book bans, uh, that they can still access them through our 1000 Books campaign. We're also trying to raise awareness about this issue of book bans uh, through our current campaign, which is going on all throughout this banned books week called hashtag break the tape where we're wrapping backpacks um, or backpack straps in caution tape and having students take pictures with them. Uh, you can see some of that on the Instagram um, to, in order to raise awareness about uh, how people are trying to deem the contents of our backpacks, you know, as dangerous as criminal activities, right? Reading about people who are different than you should not be something that is considered akin to breaking school policies on like harming other students. And it's really ridiculous that people are trying to treat it as, it, as if it is that severe. And so this campaign is to show that, you know, even our, our right to read what we want, to think what we want is now being considered something dangerous. So I'm really excited about that. Um, you know, we just begin, we, this has just begun, but already at the recent student summit put on by Penn America, which I helped organize with the San Francisco Public Library and with my co-organizer, Margaret Weber. Um, we got to participate in that campaign and it was really great to see other students getting to take part in it, getting to talk to them about what their experiences were with book bans because, you know, in California, a lot of people like to think of us as like a very liberal state, but we actually had several students there who said like, oh, I have family in Central California, I have family in Orange County, and, you know, there, there are these really contentious school board meetings. I think one of them said like, somebody like tried to throw a book at their aunt while she was trying to speak in favor of including, um, you know, like the, the penguin book with the two, like tang oh, oh, Tango Makes Three. Yeah, Tango Makes Three. <laughs> She was trying to speak in favor of keeping that in a kindergarten classroom at a school in Orange County. And like somebody threw a book at her uh, and one of the students there shared that and everyone was very much like, I can't believe that happens in California, but it, it does. It's not, we're not a unilaterally liberal state. And I think it's really great that a youth from across California are joining together to try and advocate for this change to support um, those in the state who are currently being affected by this to bring vi visibility to this issue. And um, I'm gonna put a link to our donor box in here because we're also trying to gather funds to bring 1000 banned books um, to students who have been deprived of them in their school libraries by bringing them um, for free giveaways or to donate them to public libraries and ensure that students can still have access to them uh, that way, even if 
their school administrators deem them to be too dangerous. Leila, you're an inspiration, you and your friend. <laughs> this actually, this is so helpful to hear because it is the dark ages sometimes it feels like and seeing these efforts really give me hope. And I will ask you about the future you envision. Obviously, as we all know, the political polarization is so alarming in this country. And I keep wondering what happens when some students in some states have access to one version of history, let's say, and other students in other states have a whitewashed different version of history. Where, where will these future citizens find uh, opportunities to really dialogue, listen to one another, which is already such a challenge right now, as we all witness. Um, so it's, sometimes it's hard to see the way out. And then I'm looking at you and all your efforts, which is so moving. Where do you see the silver lining? Um, what keeps you going? Well, I think that, um you know, one of the things that keeps me going is hearing from younger students. So for example, my my little sister is in eighth grade. Uh, she joined us at the, at the student summit. And I think that it was really great to see her connecting with students who were like my age, um, I'm 17 and freshman in high school. And she got to be there and they were telling her about like, oh my God, you have to read, um, Nimona, I like loved this book. I loved its representation. I felt so seen in this book. I think that, and I thought that, you know, that could be at a school library where if they have, if they maintain access to these books or at a public library where they're able to access these books, I think that even if kids are in homes where this information is severely limited to them, there are opportunities for them to see other points of view. And that is through kids just like them, because I think a lot of times, you know, no matter, no matter what, a lot of kids are going to be um, less excited about reading and, uh, you know, questioning books if it's coming from somebody who they view as like a, a teacher. I agree a lot with what Nick said earlier, where, you know, a lot of times the books you're going to be reading in school are just not engaging and not exciting. And teachers tend to talk about books as though they're learning opportunities, which I think for a lot of students in the US are two of their least favorite words in the English language. Um, and they don't talk about them as a portal to another world where you feel seen and heard and supportive or something that celebrates your culture and really challenges other people's points of view on it. And when you have students who can talk about books that way, it makes a world of difference. Um, for example, just looking at my bookshelf, which is right here. Uh, this book, Arusha and the End of Time, was the first book I ever found in a bookstore that was about uh, Hindu mythology and Indian American culture and was all about, you know, this girl uh, who felt really Americanized and felt like she wasn't as connected with her heritage. And it turns out that she has this whole connection to the world of Hindu mythology. Um, it's amazing. And I read it and I only read it because um, a like older girl in my school library was reading it. And I said, like, what are you reading? And she said basically the same thing. Like, I was so excited to see a book that also talks about, you know, uh, mixed race Indian girls. And we really bonded over that. I still know her to this day. And I would like to see like other kids getting to share and bringing books to other people in that way. Um, and I think another thing that you mentioned is like, what is this world going to look like if we have students who are learning two different versions of history? Um, and I think that I'm really concerned about what that's going to look like in school districts where you have, you know, people who maybe are all going to the same high school, but they had very different elementary school experiences. Um, I'm also concerned about what that's going to look like in colleges, uh, where a lot of times people are allowed like more opportunities for like actual debate. And I honestly feel concerned that one day my younger sister is going to be in a college lecture hall or something, and people are going to try and debate, um, you know, 
people are going to try and debate the Holocaust again because I, I bring this up because there's actually like it's a thing in, in middle school debates a lot of the times I've seen prompts where it's like prompt slavery one side is pro and one side is against it and there's school districts where they're still advocating to keep these things around and I'm really concerned that you know if these kinds of views this kind of both sides in and at the same time you're being exposed to really narrow narrow-minded rhetoric I'm concerned that in college classrooms you're going to have rooms full of students where half the room is fully willing and thinks it is justified to invalidate the other half's human rights and lived experiences and heritage uh, and the right to be treated as a human being and feel safe in their classroom. And I'm just really concerned that in the future, we're gonna see school rooms where half the students are concerned that their classmates are going to be spreading misinformation about their backgrounds or are going to be saying that, uh, they are subhuman because of who they like. And I think we're already starting to see a lot of this parroted by kids, um, you know, because a lot of this starts in the home, but there is hope that if in schools, kids are exposed to this different points of view and different information that it, this perspective can be broken and mm -hmm. that kids can have the opportunity to become the kinder, more empathetic individuals that uh, a lot of us grow into through our love of reading. Um, through having free access to books about other people, like, you know, like I said, um, I still have classmates in the student social justice group I'm part of at my school who will bring up like, you know, I'm Leela, I remember like your mom would come in and read these books, or I had another classmate who was Ethiopian and her mom would come in and tell us about their traditions and cultures. And I feel like a lot of those people who were really engaged by this and really into this are still some of the kindest, most caring individuals I know. And so when people as parents or as educators expose kids to lots of different viewpoints, expose them to a lot of different perspectives, they teach children a sense of empathy and cultural consciousness they carry with them into the world and that they use to become the kind of people who can, you know, it, it, it's sad that this should be like a trait that's valued because it's so basic, but the kind of people who can go into classrooms and recognize that you know, maybe it's not the time to debate other people, hu people's human rights so they can show basic respect, decency and caring to others. And yeah, I think it's just really sad that we're having, having to have this conversation of what's the world gonna look like where maybe half the classroom doesn't believe in the other's right to exist, but it is something that needs to be acknowledged and something that I'm very concerned about. Layla, if you ever run for office, you have my vote. <laughs> Whatever you do, I know you are going to be, we are in, this country is in good hands with leaders like you. Thank you. That was so well said, everything you said. Um, I, before we turn it to the Q&A from the audience, there is this one question. I mean, I have so many questions, of course, but there is this one question that I, I really would like to ask the whole panel. Um, and it is about the theme of this year's Band Books Week, which is Let Freedom Meet Read. I want to ask what that means to you all, especially because it's very interesting that in this land of the free, freedom of freedom to read is under attack. And the most prominent national organizations that are pushing for these book bands, like two of them, one of them is called Moms, Moms for Liberty, the other is Citizens Defending Freedom. And while their names uphold freedom uh, and liberty, you know, their actions seem to come from a place of fear. And why are books such a threat to their freedom? What are they so afraid of when it comes to books? I'd love to hear your thoughts. That's a big question. <laughs> so I, I'm going to launch with um, I think the, the fear is rooted in um, control um, and power. Um, one of the things that I can't help but notice is, you know, for this on the school library front, you know, um, there's this assumption that all kids, the kids have access, that readers have access to books all the time in their homes. And that is not true. And more often than not, the school library is the one place where they can get access to books. 
because not everybody is fortunate enough to live near a public library and not everyone is privileged enough to be able to just order a book on Amazon or wherever you think you can get them, right? That's just not the truth. Um, so we have a lot of book deserts. And um, when, you, when you add that to the also part of, you know, books, um, yes, they are stories for us to learn about and other people, but they're also filled with information um, that educate us. And I mean, I think about me, I'm a product of public education. Um, the elder piece of like just public, public education being just a foundation of, of uh, our democracy in terms of because of it being free, um, that the control, again, that control is rooted in the ideas. Um, I, I believe too that a lot of this, these actions is, is another way to undermine access to public education too. And that's a whole other Zoom meeting um, um, and conversation. But when I think about um, the freedom to read, I also am reminded that at all libraries, whether you're a school library, a public library, a pub academic library, they are spaces of voluntary inquiry. Nobody forces anyone to go into a school library to check out a book. You choose what you wanna read. We all have our parameters and our guidelines that we have to follow. But when a one, one parent is deciding for all parents, that's a problem. Um, and we think about, I think about um, the tactics um, in terms of, you know, like reading passages, that's a shame tactic tactic. That's totally about shame, you know, and unfortunately, you know, there are administrators that are, you know, giving in and, and not and not rather than maybe encouraging people to follow processes and stuff. And so I think we have to be really mindful and careful because when you remove one book, then it becomes easier to remove another. When you but when you hold the line and you say, well, we have a process and if you have a problem, here's what you do. And then, I mean, they're maybe they're gonna keep filling out the form and that's fine, but maybe they're not gonna keep coming back with more books to remove. So yeah, I, I find it just as ironic that these people that are for freedom are taking away the freedom of others and access for others. Yeah, it's all interesting to me because all of it is, it's all like a matter of interpretation, right? Like as a person who, wields words and wields language um, to make a living. If there's one thing I have taken, not only from everything happening now, but also from the research I'm doing for this, this new book in the Dear Universe, it's that part of the reason things are constantly changing is because the way that we interpret language is constantly changing. And I, so I grew up, I was born in 1985, and I have this very vivid memory of being in elementary school in the late 80s and early 90s, there was this song called Knowledge is Power. It was like, knowledge is power. I know what I know. Do you, have you guys heard this? I was like a little kid, but I remember every word of it. It's like, the more you learn, the farther you grow. Um, we actually believe that, I think, is really what it comes down to. I genuinely think that people deep down do believe that knowledge is power. So anywhere there is the ability to gain knowledge that exists outside of what a person in power already wants you to believe. There's fear there. And books, books are the places where people are able to gain new knowledge that has the power to challenge the current power structures. Um, the Holocaust Museum, Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, Israel, when you first walk into the memorial, it's such a, it's a fascinating, memorial and it's also like really it's intense but when you first walk in one of the first displays there's this section that's all of these books and there's a video playing in the center of a book burning ceremony and it talks about how really things got started with a push against certain types of knowledge being available right like everything that human beings do starts with language. So people, it's like if you can limit the language that people have access to and, and the things that they have access to learning about, there's this belief that you can limit, and honestly, it's true, you can limit 
how far a person can go by limiting what they can learn. So I personally think that that's part of the reason. That's probably the main reason why there's such a why the attack is so heavily focused on books and on literature. And that's also all the more reason for us to make sure these books are getting into the hands of the people who they're being kept from. Absolutely. Um, and to kind of add on to what Nick just said, um, you know, when I heard the question, it made me think a lot about um, what I had learned from my experience working for the Uyghur American Association, um, which is the US uh, and Canada, Mexico, uh, North American branch of the World Uyghur Congress. Um, and when we would go to congressional lobbying meetings, uh, which I was lucky enough to assist some uh, Uyghur camp survivors in participating in this year, we would go to the meetings, they would always start with how um, first the Chinese government would take away, took away and imprisoned the Uyghur academics, the poets, the writers, the teachers, the people who distributed knowledge um, about their traditions, their cultures, their people uh, in a way that the Chinese government didn't approve of and criticized the government in a way that they believed was not appropriate for these people to hear. Um, and I think of how the same politicians whose offices I went into who were more than happy to say, you know, how horrible it was that, you know, China was taking away, who, who were more than happy to say as, as, you know, as most people should, as everyone should, but China was doing something horrible to the Uyghurs by taking this from them. Um, a lot of them, a lot of them were the same people who say that, you know, reading reading a book um, that says, don't touch my hair, um, or who, which talks about loving, loving um, the, their mother's hijab. They say that those books are also dangerous and that children shouldn't have access to them. But at the same time, you know, they're more than happy to say like how egregious it is when it's happening in a cult country uh, that, that the US is against. Um, and I think that one of the things, like again, back to the people I work with the, at the Uyghur American Association, um, one of them said like the, her favorite thing about raising her kids in the U.S. is that now, um, when she grew up in China, she would go go to schools and they would um, be all government controlled. It would be very, um, very much just government rhetoric, very controlled, very limited. And now her kids get to go to schools and they get to be in a classroom where so many people look different from them and they get to learn about their friends' cultures. They get to share what they are proud of about what makes them different. Um, and they get to share that through the books about their past and they get to bond with their friends over um, books they have in common. And um, I really, just what she said about being so excited and thrilled about how diverse and free the American education system was and how much that benefited her kids um, just really stuck with me when I'm thinking about this. Because, you know, again, like Nick said, when this has happened in the past, uh, where authoritarian regimes like the one that is targeting and carrying out a genocide against the Uyghurs in China, and that previously carried out a genocide against the Jews in the Holocaust, the first thing they come for is the books. And I I really agree. I think somebody might have said it in the chat, but it's a lot harder to control people who have the tools to question um, the decision making of their leaders. It's a lot hard to control people who are educated about things beyond what those in power want them to know. And really where all that starts and where it has started, um, you know, since ancient Rome where critics and, I, and people who are in, in for and against slave revolts would post um, this is me showing that I'm in AP art history this year, but they would like post full screeds about it on the walls of public meeting places. They would like use, they would uh, scrolls about it to disseminate this information. And when you try and limit the written word, um, what you're really doing is that you're only allowing people to know what you want them to know. You're making it easier for you to control them, to limit their access to uh, critical thinking and to limit the access of the next generation to developing a sense of empathy for others 
who you are trying to turn them against. Um, you're trying to prevent them from developing a cultural consciousness and a respect for people who are different from you. Instead, you are, what you are trying to do is get them to be afraid of what they don't know because these leaders are afraid of what they can't understand. And so instead of trying to understand others and treat them with empathy and respect, uh, which is so often modeled in these kids' books, if they had actually bothered to take a moment and read them. Um, and instead they immediately resort to demonizing them and treating uh, others' identities as though they are something dangerous and to be feared and to keep their children away from them as much as possible. Um, yeah. Thank you all. I mean, I get I the know. sense that we can probably continue this conversation for three more hours easily, <laughs> if not three more days. Uh, and I have to be mindful of time, trying to wrap it up by 7.30 for those, especially the panelists who are joining us from New York and uh, Texas. I did quickly scan the questions in the chat and very quickly, let's try to do it as quickly as we can. There's a question and perhaps um, Summer or Nick can share with us their thoughts on this. Where are the publishers? Where do the publishers stand? Are, other than because you know we talked about city lights books but in general it, it's been a bit quiet so some are doing insights i mean i can say that we we do engage with the publishers i think they they are obviously very concerned i think they do want to support their writers they do want to support these books and access and and availability of these stories. So, you know, I think they I think they are there. I think there's obviously probably more they could be doing too, but I think it, it is an important, um, you know, I do think there's an important role for them here, absolutely. And, you know, I think that um obviously they they also want their their books to be out there in the world and they want their writers to have you know, uh, successful, um, you know, opportunities for their stories to be told. I think, you know, one of the sort of um, myths around this is that it's like good for business if your book is banned, right? And, you know, that can be true for some very prominent writers. Um, but for most writers and for writers who are new or up and coming, uh, you know, it can be really devastating. And it means you don't get the, the speaking invitations. You don't get invited to the schools. You don't necessarily get invited to the bookstores in a town where your book is being targeted. So it can be very devastating. And I think it, it's important to recognize that, that the authors are being targeted by this as well. Um, so that, you know, that is very, uh, very much front of mind for us. And I know it is for the publishers as well. And also thinking about the ways in which, you know, writers alongside educators and, and librarians and, and others in this fight are, are being you know, threatened, are facing new forms of, of harassment and dangers that, you know, we deal with for writers around the world, as, as, as Lila was referencing, um, and haven't always seen in the same way here in the U.S. and not not that we haven't seen it at all, but you know it's it's occurring at a new level right now as well. And so you know I think that that is a real very much a concern for us. Um, I also just wanted to say that I don't think I could have answered your question any better than Leela did, and I think she really articulated um, basically why Pen America exists and why the Pen Global Network exists because the written word is power and writers are powerful and stories are powerful and that's why they're targeted yes. that's why authoritarians go after them that's why power you know those who hold power uh and who depend upon dividing people and pitting groups against one another to maintain that power um you know don't want people to have access to these stories that can open their minds to a different possibility to a different future um, to what an alternate world could look like. And, you know, I think that, I think that's just, I mean, Lily, you just did a really fantastic job of, of summing all of that up. So thank you for that. The only thing I'll add here um, is, like the publishers are definitely, like Penguin Random House is literally suing the state of Florida right now. So there, there's yes. stuff happening. Yeah. Um, but what Summer said is absolutely true, right? Like, I think they're starting to understand and to recognize that like, no, at this level, book bans are not actually good for the books. Like there was a point where, you know, getting a book, like I will be completely transparent here. The first time Dear Martin got banned, it shot to number one on the bestseller list, but that was 2019. Now when there are thousands of books being banned each year, it's not, that's not boosting everybody's sales. 
so they're, they are seeing that they do have to get involved and um and yeah it's it's an interesting time to be doing anything involving speaking out against injustice yeah 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 because you've become a target if you do yeah i mean mm -hmm. i'm sure you have been i know i have been mm -hmm. um it comes with a price indeed and um for sincere apologies if we haven't been able to get to your questions there was one question about what who else what champions are there i can just mention a few that I know in addition to, of course, Pan America and Freedom Fighters, there's Brooklyn Public Library, American Library Association, uh, every library, please. Um, Unite Against Book Bans. I mean, there's so many. So, um, yeah. Um, and there are, I'm noticing some, there are great resources in the chat. Links have been shared. So, thank you all for contributing. And really, it, it is about, you know, the freedom to read is going beyond the pages. Needless to say, it's about reading the world. So it requires critical thinking, imagination, memory. It requires engagement and dialogue. And as Leela said beautifully, like empathy and respect. So thank you all for joining us, engaging with us, having this dialogue with us this evening. Um, we have a lot of work to do, uh, but but it's deeply, deeply meaningful work, fundamental, the impulse and force for democracy for next generations. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thanks, thank Rob. Thanks for being with us. Yeah. Well, thank you all for gracing our virtual halls. And it was an honor for City Lights to stand in solidarity with you. In our eyes, you are all superheroes. So and thanks to all of you in the audience for joining us tonight. You are a big part of the equation. So become involved in the drive to protect books and democratic principles. Support Penn. Tonight's event has been made possible by support from the City Lights Foundation, continuing the legacy of our founder, the late Lawrence Ferlinghetti, through public events like this one, our publishing program and educational outreach. It's all dedicated to sustaining a vibrant community of readers, writers, and independent thinkers. So be safe, be well, everyone. Fight the good fight, and we hope to see you soon. Thanks, y'all. Bye. Thank Thanks, you. everyone.